Hey, Gabe. Hey, what's up, Tim? After watching this Superman movie, I have a question for you. If you could have a superpower, what would you choose? Super strength? Flight? Or the ability to Olympic-style hammer throw nuclear weapons into the sun? Tim, I think you're being super critical. Welcome to another episode of the Super Critical Podcast, where we delve into the fun and oftentimes nonsensical way pop culture portrays nuclear weapons. My name is Tim Westmeyer, someone who studies nuclear weapons and works on nuclear nonproliferation for a living. I'm fortunate to be joined today in the podcast studio, slash my kitchen table in our living room, by my usual co-host, Gabe. Gabe, welcome back. How are you doing? Hey, good. How are you, Tim? Good. Are you uh, feeling okay after watching this movie? Happy to be back being super critical, and I think this is a good one to uh, to do that on. So, yeah, we'll, we'll have some fun. I saved the best ones for you. And I'm also happy to be joined by returning guest and all-around nuke policy expert, Will Satrin. Will, welcome back. Happy to be here, Tim. It's been too long, and I'm glad to get back in the saddle. Well, Will and I work together uh, keeping the world safe from the dangers of nuclear weapons, uh, but you can follow Will on Twitter at Will Satren, W-I-L-L-S-A-E-T-R-E-N. He's got a fun Twitter. Make sure you follow it. I am particularly very happy that you guys are here because, you know, on the podcast today, we're going to talk about some serious, really big issues I know that Gabe, in particular, is, is really over superhero movies. Yeah, at least the modern ones. Uh, it's just too much. It's too much for me. Well, Superman 4, The Quest for Peace, is more than just a superhero action movie that I forced you all to watch. It also is the perfect blueprint for what to do about the danger of nuclear weapons, you know, and their potential to destroy the world. It turns out you can just grab all of them spin them in around in a circle and throw them into the sun in a space net why hasn't anybody thought of this before will is any have you seen any literature on this in, in the any of the journals i mean it seems so obvious i i don't know why nobody's thought about this before all we need is a super strong net that can hold like a gazillion tons worth of nuclear weapons yeah well it's it's too bad but we'll, we'll really get super critical about kind of what the plan was in this movie the movie itself you know the sure this idea might be a little bit controversial but the movie itself was controversial both for audiences and, sadly enough, the actors themselves. At first, it was Christopher Reeve, Superman himself, that came up with the idea. He met with uh, Warner Brother executives, Canon Pictures, uh, who produced the, the film. He came up with a story outline where Superman would be compelled to intervene in the nuclear arms race. But when the movie came out, however, he said that Superman 4 was a catastrophe from start to finish, that failure was a huge blow to my career. So was he, I mean, did he, was he, nuclear peace like a pet project of his? Why was he so interested in this? Do we have any idea? I think we'll definitely get into that right when we're done with the plot discussion, but he was inspired by a lot of things. You know, the the 80s was a big time for the nuclear peace movement. It, it kind of died down by the end of the decade once uh, Reagan and Gorbachev and, and it looked like there was going to be some kind of discussion about nuclear peace talks. But early on in the decade, right, Will, this is a pretty scary time in, in the world where we'll get into the numbers of how many nuclear weapons were out there. But you had the invasion of Afghanistan. You had lots of these proxy battles around the world. You had Reagan's rhetoric of the evil empire and Star Wars strategic defense initiative and all of these topics and people were really concerned about what the potential uh, this could mean for nuclear war. So there was campaigns to have regular public citizens trying to lobby their government to get rid of the weapons themselves. This is, this is in the U.S., but also around the world. And there were definitely the involvement of a lot of celebrities and movie people as part of this. So I think he was inspired by a lot of that, but I don't think necessarily it was executed as well as he was hoping for, probably. We also covered uh, Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice, that, that uh, gem of a film, uh, on mini-nuke episode number five. So there's some good stuff there about the time that the U.S. accidentally nuked Superman. So for this movie itself, before we get into the, 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 the meat of the episode, uh, I just wanted to provide a little bit of context. So this was directed by Sidney Fury, I think is how you pronounce his name, Fure. He is famous for the Iron Eagle movies, which are actually not too bad. The important thing is it was produced by Canon Pictures, and this is a famous studio, basically decided to buy up a bunch of movie rights and make movies on the cheap, uh, and that was their whole plan. And they produced some crazy movies like Delta Force, the He-Man movie, Masters of the Universe, 
and Breakdance 2 Electric Boogaloo oh. came out of their minds. I didn't even know there was a Breakdance 1, so... I think it was just called Breakin'. Um, <laughs> according to Box Office Mojo, Superman 4 only made $15.6 million worldwide, and this was on a $17 million budget. So not particularly great compared to $55 million for the first Superman movie. And on Rotten Tomatoes, it gets an 11% fresh. And according to readers of Empire Magazine, it is number 40 on a list of the top 50 worst movies of all time. Which is kind of weird. I mean, nowadays we have these superhero movies that are just such high budget. The studios just pour everything into them. I mean, like what happened here that it was just so, like what made this such a failure? Well, I think one of the biggest things is that that's how Canon Pictures did their films. They were given $35 million or $36 million, I think, from Warner Brothers to help finance the film. But because they were really good at weird accounting rules, they were like, we're only going to spend $17 million on this. And that got oh cut like at the last minute. And they also cut 45 minutes from the final picture. But when it was all done, they, the thought there was if the film is shorter, theaters can show it more often. And we can make more money. Oh, my God. Well, the good thing about that is I didn't have to watch 45 <laughs> extra minutes of this garbage, so they saved me some time. Um, and here's just a, a final example of how this all worked out. This is from Christopher Reeve in his uh, book. He wrote that the screenwriters wrote a scene in this movie where Superman would land on 42nd Street in New York City. He would walk the double yellow lines to the United Nations where he gives a speech. If this had been done in Superman 1, we would likely have a shot it on 42nd Street. The director would have choreographed hundreds of pedestrians and vehicles and cut to people gawking out of offices' windows at the sight of Superman walking down the street, like the Pied Piper. Instead, we had to shoot on an industrial park in England, in the rain, with about a hundred extras, not a car in sight, and a couple dozen pigeons thrown in for atmosphere. Oh my god. So that's, um, that's the kind of movie we're working with here. Well, and this movie did have some fairly high firepower in the casting department, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, so we had, you mentioned Christopher Reeve as Superman. Yeah, we got every, basically the whole cast back. You got Gene Hackman as, as uh, his arch rival, Lex Luthor, who doesn't have any powers, but he is very smart. Right. And uh, he's, he's a super stable genius. <laughs> exactly. And uh, there are lots of, uh, unfortunately, lots of comic book series where he ends up becoming president. Then we also have Margaret Kidder. Uh, she's back as Lois Lane, who sometimes love interest of Superman. She's also a really good reporter in her own right. Superman's alter ego, sorry, spoiler alert, is Clark Kent. Superman, in case anyone, no one knows who about this about him. He was born on a planet uh, that was dying called Krypton, and his parents in the, in the last moments decided to put him into a spaceship and shoot him away towards just hopefully to land somewhere safe uh, as their own planet destroyed itself. Superman lands on Earth. And it turns out his Krypton body, when you take our Earth's sun and shine light onto it, it makes him into Superman. He's able to be, what? what is his power? Super flight, super strength, he can burn things with his eyes, he can blow things really cold with his mouth. He's all kinds of different powers. Whatever they need to write in at the time. And then, so, this is this guy Mark Pillow as Nuclear Man. Yeah. Um, I don't know what, what else he's been in. Nothing but, else. Yeah. Uh, we'll get into that. He's a body, basically like a bodybuilder. Um, they okay. dub over his voice with Gene Hackman. Okay. Yep. And then uh, John Cryer uh, from Two and a Half Men fame and some other 80s stuff. Uh, I thought that was an interesting casting choice as well. Yeah. yeah. I, I, did, I did not see that one coming. <laughs> Yep, uh, I joked on Twitter that the, the original movie poster for this first Superman was uh, You'll Believe a Man Can Fly, and I changed it to You'll Believe a Man Can Cry. Oh, uh, that's great. Er, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's, so that's what we're going to be dealing with on this uh, particular episode. There's also a comic book adaptation that DC Comics did uh, for the movie, and it differs in different places from the f actual film because, of course— they didn't know that 45 minutes was going to be cut from the movie, so they had the original script. You can talk a little bit about that. Uh, and there's also some other related comic books that deal with Superman dealing with nuclear weapons. I think it'll be worth talking about. So let's run through the plot of the movie here. Uh, let's get super critical. So spoiler warning, if you haven't seen this movie, I believe it's from 1986, 87? I think 87. 87. Um, spoiler warning, if you haven't seen the movie. Uh, go, go check it out. It's, it's out there. Maybe watch the first couple ones first so you know that these movies aren't all bad. The greatest hope against the threat of nuclear war is Superman. I'm going to do what our governments have been unwilling or unable to do. Effective immediately, I'm going to rid our planet of all nuclear weapons. Uh. 
The greatest threat to Superman is Lex Luthor. Smarter than I thought. We can make the world safe for war profits. He's created the ultimate weapon to annihilate the Man of Steel. You risk worldwide nuclear war for your own personal financial gain. Nobody wants war. I just want to keep the threat alive. <laughs> Dude of Steel, <laughs> where are you gonna get it? You know you're a workaholic. Why don't you stop and smell the roses, huh? Superman 4, Christopher Reeve, Gene Hackman, Jackie Cooper, John Cryer, with Mariel Hemingway and Margot Kidder as Lois Lane. Superman 4, his most important adventure, the quest for peace. Gabe, Will, if you'll, if you'll humor me for a second here, uh, I want to read a short plot description of this movie, which was written by Common Sense Media, and I found this on the DirecTV's website when it says what kind of programming it has, whether this movie is appropriate for your kids. Oh, okay, so yeah, you're debating what your kids like, oh, I really want to watch Superman 4, Superman 4, and you're like, oh, okay, maybe, yeah. Well, I, I have a kid coming next year, and this is the kind of stuff I guess I'm going to have to start paying attention to. Like, is if my child is eight plus old, that's how old they want you to your kids to be to see this movie first. Here's what it says: Parents need to know that this movie series features the amiable Christopher Reeve as the 1930s cartoon superhero. Superman promises to get rid of the world's nuclear weapons, a task that proves beyond him, but it will raise the scary issue of possible world destruction for the young kids for whom this movie targets. Superman fights an evil super being bent on Superman's destruction, and the ensuing growling, brawling, and explosions may frighten small children. There are multiple references to the violent destruction of Superman's home planet and the loss of his parents. Adults smoke cigars, and there's one use of the word hell. Oh my god. I love the, the cigar smoking thing. I mean, like... Back, like, 40 years ago, kids would, like, be trapped in rooms with their parents just smoke chain smoking. And, like, now it's, like, you can't even see somebody smoke a cigar. That's a, that's dangerous. I also loved that they listed uh, ensuing growling yeah. as something that could be startling or alarming to children. People can make their own decisions. I made you guys watch this movie, and I clearly didn't look at the warning label first. Uh, so sorry about that. I know Will, in particular, growling is a trigger for you. It, it really is, but uh, I'll, I'll survive. So I get some cognitive dissonance right at the very beginning of this movie because it starts with John Williams' excellent score of Superman. Everybody kind of knows this, even if you've never even seen these movies. But it's combined with some terrible, cheap-looking opening credit graphics. Uh, so you know you're kind of in for some fun here. Uh, what's the first scene, Gabe? We got Superman saving some cosmonauts? Yeah, so the, the cosmonauts are on a, a Russian space station that appears to be suspended. I think you can still see the strings. Um, there's a cosmonaut who's doing a spacewalk, and they're having some funny banter in Russian. And uh, sure enough, a piece of space debris comes and knocks the, the astronaut, the car, the cosmonaut, I should say, away. And um, sure enough, you know, the astronauts are panicking, and then Superman shows up flying out of space his cape flapping in the vacuum of space, and then the music builds up, and he is able to save all the cosmonauts. He rescues the guy who's floating out there. Somehow manages to talk to them, I guess, through the vacuum of space as well. In Russian, too. Yeah, in, like, really bad dubbed Russian. But he's... Superman is... Because he has superpowers, he doesn't need a spacesuit. The cosmonaut's in the spacesuit, and Superman can just talk to him like normally. Like mm -hmm. I guess he, one of his superpowers is being able to project his voice through the vacuum of space. That's now. not a joke, actually. I think in the 1930s, one of his abilities, because in the 1930s, the ability to like be a vent ventriloquist was like considered a superpower. What I was one of his things he could do was super hearing. And the ability to throw his voice. Oh my god. The, the power, I mean, people back then, it was just so easy. You could, like, you could amaze them with anything. Like, come see the miracle of ventriloquism and radio. <laughs> yep, uh, so Superman saves the day, uh, but then he gets to more of a kind of quiet, somber moment. So Superman, uh, a.k.a. his alter ego, Clark Kent, visits his home on the Kent farm in Kansas. Martha and Jonathan Kent have passed on. And he's ready to sell the farm. But before he does, he goes into the barn and recovers some glowing green crystals from his home, uh, the birth rocket that basically got him to Earth. 
he doesn't want to sell the farm to some sort of big developer. There's this kind of funny scene back and forth where the developer wants to sell it so they can build like what a Walmart or some kind of shopping mall type thing. Clark Kent pretends to be really bad at baseball because that's Clark Kent's whole thing. He has to pretend to be like this bumbling, weak, ineffective yeah. person. And of course, as soon as the developer looks away, he like cracks the baseball in, into space, which I, that might have been the thing that caused the mirror space station to get hurt. So he's just got to be careful where he hits these things into space. Yeah, that, so I actually thought exactly that when I saw that scene, too. It's like, do, you, you just saved some cosmonauts from getting hit by yeah. space junk. Now you're creating more space junk. Come on, man. It's terrible. He does grab this crystal, and it's important because this crystal is, like, talking to him. It's his connection to his home planet, and they mention, like, the crystal, it speaks to him. I think it's his parents or maybe his, his other ancestors, and it says, this has great power. It connects you to your home planet. It's a MacGuffin that will save the day at some point. Use it wisely. You get it one shot, and then you get disconnected from your home planet okay for somebody who is not uh, i'm not well versed in superman lore is does this is this like appear in some of the other comics or the other movies or was this just written in to this this crystal just to as a plot device here mostly for this movie except he had crystals on his ship in the earlier films that he used to create the fortress of solitude okay which is somewhere in like the north pole it's where he hangs out you know that's where his like his home base of operations is I don't know what this extra green crystal is and kind of why it's just kind of been there and why it's not at the Forge of Solitude. And it's glowing green. It looks like kryptonite, but it's not. Yeah. and Kry- <sighs> Kryptonite like, gives off this radiation from his home planet, and that's his only weakness. Superman's susceptible to magic. People who in the DC comic book universe who can do magic can hurt him. Okay. Uh, and also kryptonite. Right. It's kind of his two big bugaboos. The, the other thing, too, is this crystal – when it when the crystal's talking to him, which is very bizarre – it's also saying, like, this is your last connection to your home planet, and once you use this crystal's powers, you'll be officially, like, a, a part of Earth. And I think that kind of plays into the whole, like, vibe of the movie, too. And, right. Yeah. The debate about whether or not he is an alien who's just, like, vacationing on Earth, or whether or not right. he's firmly part, part of this becomes planet. becomes part, yeah. Yeah, it's a plot thing. I'm not sure exactly what it what it's going for. Will, you, you haven't seen the other movies that kind of come, come across to you as well. So I, I haven't seen any of the other Superman movies, but I did read a lot of the comics, um, and I saw some of animated TV series and stuff. So the the crystals like do have a, a pretty big role in in Superman lore. So I I didn't think it was that far out there, but um, again, I mean it was kind of cheesily done. Speaking of some cheese, uh, we we get to some uh, a, a scene of like a prison like rock gang. Right? Is that not the right way to call it? They're like they're like a chain gang. Chain they're, gang. they're like mining. Yeah, they're. We see Lex Luthor in this prison chain gang. Right? He's he's chipping away at rocks, but he doesn't really want to be doing that because he considers himself like a a brilliant man. He's whistling Mozart, and fortunately, for some reason, there's two guards. The only two guards that are guarding them get distracted by this like youth coming in in a fancy car. It basically, distracts them by like, hey, do you want to check out this cool car? Listen to my tunes. And then, of course, the car is, like, remote-controlled, and the two guards get almost killed? They should I, I, have died, yeah, I think right? They're, yeah, I mean, they, they, he traps them in the car once they're sitting in there. Like, the doors lock and the windows go up, and the very slowly moving uh, retractable roof closes. The, the officers make no effort to get mm-hmm. out of the car, and then, yeah, he just drives them off a cliff. I think they're dead. Yeah, I, it, it's like G.I. Joe when a helicopter explodes and you see the parachute of the guy coming right out of it. <laughs> you do see him, like, crawling up. In the comic book, they, like, open the doors so that they can jump out at the last minute. But whatever. It, the whole thing, it means that Lex Luthor and his now, his nephew, whose name is Lenny? Yeah, Lenny. Uh, yeah, Lenny, played by John Cryer. Uh, they get to do their next plan, right? And, of course, much like Pinky and the Brain, their plan is what they do every single time, which is... Destroy Superman! <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Except now with like a, a, a 80s teen, like stereotypical 80s teen punk with attitude and also a little bit dumb. I do okay or what, Uncle Wax? Lenny, I've always considered you the Dutch elm disease in my family tree. But this time, nephew, you did fine. Clark Kent and Lois Lane, um, they're trying to take the subway to work. Of course, though, Gabe, this is actually filmed in the... Yeah, it was the London Underground, which is so <laughs> weird because uh, they ha- they put all like the New York style signing in the London Underground. Like, why are they? But I guess if they filmed it on a soundstage, they must have done some filming in the UK. But yeah. and I guess it kind of looked a little fut- a little more futuristic than uh, trains here in the US. Yeah, because Metropolis is the city where Superman lives in the United States. It's not New York because New York also exists. 
Oh, okay. Because whenever they have the external shots of Metropolis, it's very clearly New yeah. York, like the Statue of Liberty. There's actually one scene involved, like the Statue yeah. of Liberty, and you see the Twin Towers. This is before they, they were destroyed, obviously. Yeah, it was just weird to see that in London Underground. And they're trying to get uh, to work, but the subway, I guess the driver, the conductor, has a heart attack. It's just an extra scene to show Superman doing stuff. So he saves the day again, but unfortunately it means that he's late to work. And he was late to realize the fact that the paper had been sold to this tabloid journalist. It's like Rupert Murdoch buying the Daily Planet and, you know, putting sexy photos on. In fact, I'm surprised they didn't include that in the children's warning. This guy who wants to, like, sex up the paper a little bit. Yeah, because at some point there's this, like, backdrop of nuclear arms discussions that are taking place between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And the headline that they want to put is, Summit Kaput. Yeah. Is exactly. the world going to destroy itself yeah. kind of thing? But there's also, I, I mean, there's also this, like, strange vibe there of them trying to, like, sex things up. And the guy's daughter, the, the guy who buys the paper. Lacey? Um, Lacey yeah, Warfield? Lacey yeah. Warfield, uh, played by uh, Mariel Hemingway. You know, her daddy is going to let her run the paper, and she gets this crush on Superman. And she comes in wearing these, like, very inappropriate outfits. And just, like, these awkward advances. Like, at one point, she calls him into her office and she's, like, laying on the desk, like, sideways, like, oh, I, I lay on my desk in a sexy pose all the time. And she then she's, like... She offers him promotion. Yeah, she's, she like, massaging him. him. It, it's, it does not hold up well circa 2019 at all. It's a bit different than how you would handle it today. Or it's also a perfect look into the power of uh, power <laughs> dynamics in this office. Uh, but she ultimately becomes uh, – we'll, we'll get into it later. She becomes a little bit of a better character near the end. Yeah. But right now, her journalistic uh, – instincts are to do what her father does which is essentially fake news C- create false headlines yeah. create stories as opposed to reporting on them we f- we get to another scene uh really quickly in, in a museum somewhere in metropolis where they got a strand of superman's hair and his hair is so strong a single strand can hold up this uh thousand pound weight and you can tell it's the thousand pound weight because it's written on the side thousand pounds of course what happens to what lex luther and his nephew they steal the hair you know what I can do with a single strand of Superman's hair? You can make a toupee that flies. That hair is a sample of Superman's genetic material. The building blocks of his body. With my genius and enough nuclear power to mutate the genes, I can create a being who's more powerful than him. His total allegiance to me. Can I? Can we just take a quick detour? The way they steal it, I thought there'd be some elaborate plan. They just smash the glass with a hammer and like take it with yeah. bolt cutters. It's ridiculous. And the bolt cutters don't have kryptonite or anything on them. I mean, yeah. in the comic book, Superman has to shave by using his own heat vision and a mirror to kind of reflect it so that he can shave. But apparently the bolt cutters are perfectly fine for this. It's a little inconsistent sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that too. Uh, like, I was like, oh, well, I guess it makes sense if they're going to use the bolt cutters and, like, you know, cut the actual, like, you know, the human pieces of metal that are holding it. But no, no they cut the hair. It's like, no, nah, man, that, that, that wouldn't work. <laughs> Clearly now they have some DNA from Superman, and it, it's a perfect timing for their plan because things are starting to get a little bit rough and distracting Superman and his, his priorities. I don't think at this point he realizes that Lex has escaped prison. This is one of the things I love Superman comic books, but he's it is weird. He can apparently just hear anything around the world if he's listening. Like clearly, he knew that there was something wrong with the Mir space station. Right. No one reported it. It just happened, and he and he and he went there. But he doesn't hear the fact that Lex Luthor is like escaping from prison, or that he's at the museum, or whatever. It, it's a little self-selective about this in the comic books too. Yeah, and like this is a problem. Like any type of art where you have those like omnipotent characters, it you the, like the more powerful the character gets, the more you run into these sort of like weird things that you start to think about as a yeah as a viewer, and you're just like, wait, that doesn't make any sense. And and this is a preview for our conversation later about the nuclear points. You know, if you have someone that has this power, and you also have this danger of nuclear weapons in the world. What role and responsibility does he have? And also as a storyteller, people who are writing these things and, and Christopher Reeve, when he's writing the, the story for the movie, what, how do you tell that story? Because if he can just fix everything, what's the stakes? And if he can fix everything, what does the world look like for the rest of the comic books that have to deal with this world? Does he just fix everything? You know, what, That's the kind of thing that I think – if there's anything interesting in this movie, it's those kind of topics. But so the U.S. president comes on the television – And says that, quote, because the summit has failed, we must strive to be second to none 
in the nuclear arms race. And it looks like we're about to do some stuff, with, whether it's build new weapons, build more weapons, you know, push the ante to become uh, the strongest nuclear power. And at some point later on in the story, in Russian, you actually hear the Russian president basically say the exact same thing. We can't be second to none uh, against the United States. And this causes a lot of people to be concerned, including uh, a, a classroom somewhere in the world. And you have a, a teacher who turns this, the radio off and tells the kids, like, all right, kids, what should we do about this? Now, I know you're all upset by the crisis. The best thing we can do is to try to think positively. Why don't we write to our congressman? That'll do a lot of good. Somebody has to be an optimist. Jeremy, what do you think we can do about the crisis? He doesn't even know what's going on. I tell you, I'd write a letter to that would do some good. Who, Santa Claus? No, Superman. This, I, this is like the Wesley Crusher moment of like this like little kid who has this idea that nobody thought of. And like not even Superman thought about it. Like, hmm, why don't I get rid of the nuclear weapons? It's just like this kid comes up with this idea. That everyone looked over. Yep, and he writes a, a letter, and it goes uh, gets sent to the Daily Planet. I guess that's a pretty good place because they always have pictures of Superman. Maybe they can pass along the letter. Will, why don't you read this powerful letter that convinces Superman to to maybe do something about the world's nuclear power? And if you can do your best impression of Jeremy as a small child while you're reading it too. All right, I'll I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, caveat that I have a, a little bit of a cold. So, uh... dear Superman. Forgive me for writing to you, but my teacher is speaking about the president's speech on the arms race. We are all really unhappy about it. He, he, uh, Jeremy sounds like Mr. Hankey, yeah. in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> and I said, we should get Superman to rid the world of nuclear arms. Because only he can do it. I don't care if everyone thinks that I'm a space cadet. Once you destroy all the nuclear arms in the world... They'll see that I'm right. <laughs> Superman can make sure we don't blow ourselves up quick and easy. Thanks again, buddy. Jeremy. Hi-ho. Oh, my God. That's amazing. That makes me hate the kid even more than, <laughs> than when I saw it in the movie. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I was going for. Perfect. Of course, Lacey uh, Warfield, the uh, person who's now running the Daily Planet, she sees this letter being read. And she decides to turn this into a really big story to sell papers uh, and try to force Superman to reply. Superman, of course, doesn't reply. So what do they do? They run a headline that says, Superman says to kid, drop dead. And this is like, this is ripping off. There was that headline, the Daily News headline when President Gerald Ford says to New York City, it's like, oh, really? Ford to New York City, drop dead. And it's just like, <laughs> come on, like, it's ridiculous. This does affect Clark. He debates with himself at the Fortress of Solitude that we mentioned earlier. He tries to figure out whether or not to get involved. Uh, through the power of uh, kryptonite Skype, there's a chat he has with his ancestors about this idea. And Superman says, I know I'm forbidden to intervene, but the Earth is threatened by the same fate as Krypton. And his ancestors say, Earth is too primitive. If you teach Earth to put its fate in any one man, even yourself, you're teaching them to be betrayed. Betrayed. But, yeah, the, betrayed. The, yeah, they, they, betrayed. He, he says betrayed like 50 times. It's weird. So what's the um you mentioned that there's the um this comic book version and I think there's some content there, there's some coverage in there of this scene with the kid in the comic yeah. book version that goes further than the movie did. Yeah, he actually Superman shows up at Jeremy's school uh which is you would think that would make the kid like popular that he wrote a letter and got Superman to show up at the school. But Superman of course comes to the school and says, "I wanted to answer Jeremy's letter personally. I wanted to tell you that what you ask is impossible." I've made a vow not to interfere with the destiny of your planet. But don't worry, I'll pass this letter on to world leaders, and they'll be the ones who represent the people of Earth. And I, I like how it's like, well, it's it's impossible. I, I, I made a vow. Like, yeah. it's, 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 can't okay. not adhere to the vow. I mean, I could help you. I just don't want to. <laughs> I, I, I can save all these other people doing all these other things, but this one thing I can't do. Yeah. yeah. But uh, he'll pass the letter along, right? He'll, he'll forward the, the letter to the people who have the power. That's like you're talking to a Comcast uh, super, like yeah. yeah, Comcast agent for your your cable or something. Like, I'll pass this along to somebody who can do something. <laughs> uh, so Superman, he's trying to figure out in the movie kind of what to do next, and he reveals himself to be Clark Kent to Lois Lane. Uh, at, at various points in the first form of these movies, he he tells Lois Lane either figures it out or he tells her 
Uh, he also has his power where he can give her a kiss and then her mind gets erased because he has also telepathic powers when he needs to. He did that in Superman 2. In Superman 3, I don't, I can't remember if Lois Lane's really even in it or if it's, it's not a part of the story that she knows who he is uh, in real life. But he reveals himself to be Clark Kent. They go on a, a little bit of a fly. Uh, the graphics are not so great. Uh, this is definitely an example of where the budget cuts hurt their ability to make this work well. And Clark basically is convinced because of Lois says, you, you know, you need to uh, follow your gut. Do what your heart tells you, essentially. First he says your heart, then your gut. Somewhere yeah. in your torso, right. follow yeah, that yeah. guidance. And then he goes to get a ham sandwich. Oh, no, no, no. He, so he decides to yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, he decides yeah. To save the world. <laughs> I mean, you got to eat first. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't the save the world on an empty stomach, man. That's... Very good point. Uh, he gives her another kiss that wipes her memory, and then he decides to take a walk with Jeremy in, I think it's supposed to be New York City. It's where the United Nation's at. Gabe, it's your turn. You're you're Superman. You're oh, addressing the delegates. The Assembly of World Delegates, I, what I think is meant to be the United Nations, uh, every person has raised their hand to sponsor you, to give a speech. What is this? What no, are these yeah. words? No pressure. No pressure at all. Okay. <clears throat> For many years now, I've lived among you as a visitor. I've seen the beauty of your many cultures. I've felt great joy in your magnificent accomplishments. And I have seen the folly folly of your wars. wars. As of today, I'm not a visitor anymore. Because the Earth is my home too. We can't live in fear. And I can't stand idly by and watch us stumble into the madness of possible nuclear destruction. And so I've come to a decision... I'm going to do what our governments have been unwilling or unable to do. Effective immediately, I'm going to rid our planet of all nuclear weapons. Yeah, Yeah, everybody like goes nuts after he says that. And it's like, well, if this is something you all wanted to do anyway, why didn't you just do it? I mean, even the people in the permanent five members of the United Nations Security Council, the people with nuclear weapons. I saw USA as one of the... Uh, name tense, and that person was was clapping and cheering. So you get, at this point, China, Russia, the United States, France, and the UK are announced nuclear powers. Israel probably has the weapons at this point. India has tested a peaceful, quote-unquote, nuclear explosion. So they have the ability, but they don't have a full arsenal just yet of weapons. Pakistan probably could also do it if they wanted to. South Africa has nuclear weapons at this point. I think they have like six weapons that are dismantled, but they could use them at some point. Yeah, so all these people clap and sound like they're all on board, right? Which is really, I I thought this was one of the more uh, fascinating parts of the entire movie. Uh, Because again, like the nuclear, the delegates from the nuclear weapons states are like clapping. So I could like, I paused the movie at this point and I identified uh, the woman who's representing the UK and the guy who is representing China and they just start clapping. It's very interesting to me to look at like this uh, world that Christopher Reeves envisioned and then compare it to, for instance, like the, the ban treaty talks that are yep. going on right now, the TPNW. And, you know, the nuclear weapon states want absolutely nothing to do with that. So it's, it's very, um, it seems idealistic and a, a little bit off from what the reality might actually be. Every country in the world that's a member of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, which is a lot of them, it was 1970, uh, it was a big thing that John F. Kennedy wanted to, to see in the world. Also, India really was a, was a major push uh, for the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. Ultimately, they didn't, they didn't sign or ratify it, but P5 did. And they pledged to those that had nuclear weapons would get rid of them at some point in time, but they would get rid of weapons and they would do their best to cease the the nuclear arms race and that countries that don't have them pledge to not build them. The U.S. has pledged to do this, but clearly through the arms race of the Cold War, they haven't gone through in doing it. That's kind of the situation we get when everyone's clapping. Yeah, and I, you know, every time I come on this podcast, I try to work in The Prisoner's Dilemma because uh, I think it <laughs> explains a lot. And I, 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 when I watched this, I kind of thought, okay, yeah, this is something they all kind of want to get rid of, but you know, you can't just, you can't agree to do this because if somebody else cheats, then the whole thing falls apart. Right. Um, somebody else could easily, you know, make some nuclear weapons. So they're pro- maybe they're all happy that now there's this higher power that will actually enforce this. They don't have to worry about the prisoner's dilemma game anymore. And they can go back to their people back home and they're not going to look weak on security, but they'll say, yeah, we want to make more nuclear weapons, but, you know, Superman told us we can't have them. So it's out of our hands. Yeah, that's a good point. It's, it's how they can talk about it to their constituents. That's how presidents, if they want it, or prime ministers or leaders can go to their like special interests and say, hey, man, the guy that can melt us with his eyeballs said we can't have them anymore. And it does try to get at that, like, 
that we are uh, people who are like realists, uh, which is a, a, a type of uh, way of thinking about foreign policy, which says everybody is out to get their own. It's an anarchic system. There's no police that can enforce uh, peace amongst people or uh, enforce peace agreements. So everybody needs to promote their own national interest. And if everybody does that, that's actually going to be fine because everybody will balance each other out and everything will work out. It's more like when you have situations where people trust someone else and they try to promote other interests above their own, which you end up getting in bad situations. Superman breaks that because he has the ability to do things like trust but verify. Superman can see anything, hear everything, uh, except for lead. He can't see through lead. So if you don't have your nuclear weapons in lead lining, then you can see them. So X-ray machines are okay. He's not going to get rid of those. Yeah, no, no, those are those are fine. One other question though: If he's willing to do this, like, why not take the extra step and get rid of like small arms as well? I, I, I just don't, you know, mm-hmm. and all these other weapons. It's just they should have written something into this movie explaining why he's willing to do this for nuclear weapons and not for like every other type of weapon. Well, I got I got some stuff on that for another comic book where he does do that, but it's not necessarily a very happy tale. But I'll get to that a little bit later. Will. I was going to say, too, like, he sort of does that, right? When they talk about, like, nuclear weapons and how nuclear weapons are the catalysts that could lead to the destruction of their planet, right? Much like Krypton, kind of. They're, they were destroyed by their own knowledge. So he does, like, I guess, small arms aren't that. It's the nuclear weapons mm-hmm. that are. As far as, you know, him intervening, I was like, well, this is an area where I have to intervene. Uh, but, you know, all, the, all these other little pesky wars, yeah, that can continue. Well, here, here's what he does. This is because this is important. This is the this is the, the the meat and potatoes of today's episode. Superman he intercepts a submarine launch ballistic missile, an SLBM, uh, that is launched from a submarine into space. Uh, I think this is meant to be a test weapon, because why are they launching? Like they're launching to test a new platform or something. And Superman intercepts this. And of course, uh, I, I don't know. It, it's kind of implied that these things have nuclear warheads on them. We're gonna get into the why that that's kind of bonkers. It's implied that they have nuclear weapons on them, or at least he maybe is trying to prevent the world from testing better weapons and improving their arsenals. So he intercepts one of those and he takes it to space. Uh, He steals a Russian mobile ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile. Uh, These are the mobile ones that are on trucks and you kind of, they lift up a little bit and then they get launched very quickly. You can't really know where they all are at any given moment. So that's like the way that, that's why they're on wheels. Uh, They're not like fixed locations. And he takes all these weapons. You see like a montage of him doing this. And he takes them all into space and he puts them in a giant net. Uh, and then he takes the net and he spins it around a couple times and within like 10 seconds chucks it into the sun. And it's sure it's a comic book movie. It's very impressive that he's able to like plot course trajectory and orbits and stuff. I mean, he's Superman. Come on. He's very good. He's very smart. Um, it takes light. Eight minutes, like eight and a half minutes to reach Earth. So if you if this thing he threw at light speed should have taken at least eight and a half minutes. But whatever. It, it's very fast, right? Here's a little bit of context. So the movie came out, and as Gabe mentioned, in 1987. 1986 marked the, the peak in terms of the number of total nuclear weapons in the world. In 1986, there were 69,368 nuclear warheads in the world. And this is according to Nuclear Notebook. Uh, which is produced by Hans uh, Christensen and at the time Robert Norris. Now one of our friends, Matt Corda, works on this uh, with Hans as well. This is a really great resource. If you ever want to like know how many nuclear weapons there are in the world, they are really good at figuring this out. This stuff's not usually public, but they've gotten really good at kind of guessing. This number includes warheads and active operational forces, so things that are attached to bombers, uh, missiles or submarines, retired weapons, maybe things that are waiting dismantlement, as well as weapons that are in reserve in the stockpile that could be added to a deliverable system later. 1987 was not much better. It was like 67,000 warheads. And Russia had most of them at the time. Russia had 43,000 total warheads. Uh, The United States had just around, uh, just under 24,000. This is quite a feat for him to be able to do all of this, if we're talking about the same numbers in this particular comic book world. But Will, why don't we uh, talk a little bit about, from the nuclear policy side, what actually he accomplished here. I was. I have some questions. Is Superman grabbing all of these nuclear weapons literally as fast as he can, trying to do it all at once? All of the bombers, the missiles, the submarines. I, I really hope he lets them surface first before he starts picking them apart. Is he grabbing the weapons in storage? Like, what is your impression of kind of what is is happening here, or is he just grabbing test missiles so that they can improve? Yeah. So I, I had a couple questions about about this particular set of scenes as well. So. 
it it was unclear to me if humans were like oh well we're going to essentially like lob all of our missiles up to superman where he can then catch them and put them in his net and throw them to space right that's like one scenario that is exactly what happens in the comic book right yeah but then you know what happens to gravity bombs because they don't fly up they go down right or like uh <laughs> you know at the time uh we had a nuclear artillery right like like howitzers like how does that work so that particular aspect was a little unclear to me uh but then the other scenario that, that you laid out that they're just they're test missiles i mean that wouldn't work because we don't test with live nuclear warheads on the missiles yeah. that would be crazy right <laughs> yeah yeah, well, let's talk a little bit about that because this is really interesting. So the U.S. only really did one test where they had a missile with a live nuclear warhead that they detonated. They did this in 1962. It was The test was called Frigate Bird. It was a test of the W-47 warhead. This was on a uh, Polaris A-2 missile. So this is the Polaris system is a submarine launch ballistic missile. The USS Ethan Allen was the submarine. And no joke that they're literally both the furniture store, the Ethan Allen and the and the Boomer submarine was named after the Revolutionary War hero from Vermont. They tested this. Uh, they launched it. Uh, it was going to be a 600 kiloton yield. Pretty big. They fired uh, this. It, it aimed it at an open air ocean area, 11,000 uh, feet into the air, somewhere south of Hawaii. It missed its target by 1.2 miles, but that's not that bad when you have a 600 kiloton bomb. That's perfectly fine. Yeah, uh, what's, a, what's a couple of miles between friends? Yeah, so they, they did this thing. Uh, there was a controversy about whether the W-47 was going to be a reliable weapon. So they did this test. The Soviet Union did a similar test of a submarine-launched ballistic missile in 1961. They were a bit more responsible about it. Instead of 600 kilotons, they did a yield of six kilotons, which is 6,000 tons of TNT. They uh, did a similar thing with an ICBM, like a, a land-based missile, in 1956. In 1966, China tested one of their missiles, the uh, the Dongfen uh, 2, which was a medium-range ballistic missile. They launched this in their testing grounds somewhere in the, in the western desert of China. This was after uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, told China that, yeah, you got a nuclear program and you got a missile program, but they probably don't work really well together. And that's what a professional nuclear arsenal has. So they said, okay, hold my beer, uh, check this out. And then uh, Jeffrey Lewis is someone that we kind of we follow in our community a lot. He's the director of the East Asia Nonproliferation Program at the Middlebury Institute. He talks about kind of why that was, uh, you go to China to do this, uh, that's what they did. And that's why he's also concerned that we're going to go North Korea into saying like your missiles and your nuclear program they probably exist but they don't work really well together your bombs aren't small enough to be put onto missiles and then North Korea could be like all right but check this out and they may go out and, and do that and Jeffrey Lewis also in his in, Je in a very Jeffrey Lewis way uh, pointed out why this is crazy he says missile tests fail an errant nuclear armed missile is a terrifying thing because if you have a weapon that you're testing and you're trying to see if it works oftentimes they do fail they often push on the missile, the test missile, the abort button, which causes it to, to detonate in the air. Say it's going the wrong direction or it's going to fly and hit something. They can cause it to explode. Well, you don't have that option if you have a nuclear warhead on it, which is why it's so rare that we've ever done nuclear weapon tests with live warheads. The movie would imply that all of our tests have live warheads on them, which don't make a lot of sense because why are you detonating these things? Right. I mean, we, we haven't tested uh, live nuclear weapons in the atmosphere since the Six, 60s. Since that test I talked about, the, yeah. the one on Frigate Bird, 63, because, uh, well, 62 was when we did that test. 63 was when we signed the limited test ban treaty, which banned testing in the open atmosphere. Exactly. Um, so really, like, the only state that would feasibly test in the atmosphere would be North Korea. And again, you know, they have kept all their tests underground until now. Really, one thing that we were really worried about uh, about a year, two years ago, was that they were going to uh, put a warhead on one of their missiles, you know, uh, do an overflight over Japan and detonate it in the ocean. And obviously that would have been very escalatory, right? Yeah. And you also run the risk, for instance, okay, so that is the plan, right? That they're going to blow up this uh, empty spot of ocean. But, you know, what if the missile falls apart and the warhead goes off over Japan, right? Like, right. 
tons of risks associated with uh, testing in the atmosphere, as you said. Gabe, if you remember when we did our kind of quick episode on uh, the interview, yes. that uh, beautiful movie with uh, Seth Rogen and other people. James forget, Franco. Here we go, James Franco. Uh, we talked about that danger. Cause that was yeah. one of the concerns was fire and fury will eventually lead to open air testing. You know, for the purpose of the movie, it was very dramatic for them to show, you know, the launch and him catching and. It would probably have been less dramatic to show him collecting these other because yeah. there's other. I mean, that's not not all the weapons are going to be launched that way, right? Like yeah. like Will was saying. So like, what are the other? What, like, what would the movie have looked like if they showed him doing these other like more mundane tests? You would have to have like a, a montage with some sort of pop music playing. Uh, I don't. We'll, we'll have to think about what song we would put onto this. Maybe like the Benny Hill music, as he's like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Gabe, you could bring up a good point. What we would have to collect, we'd have to collect all of like our our land based uh, m- missiles that are in silos that aren't being tested at any particular point. We have like uh, I think at that point right now we have around 450 of them. Uh, in the 80s we had thousands of them all around the United States. We had submarines that are deployed in open ocean that we'd have to be able to collect and, and grab all of those. Each of those weapons have multiple warheads on them. Each of those missiles uh, we have to be able to grab those. We have the medium atomic de- demolition munition, the MATM, which was meant to be used like a nuclear landmine. You have all the howitzers that Will mentioned earlier that would fire nuclear shells. You've got some artillery systems at the time, all the weapons and storage. You have all of the plutonium production facilities, places where we make the nuclear material. Usually they're separated, at least in the United States, but you have pr- production facilities that are making nuclear fuel for reactors. For power reactors, so, but do you have to deal with the power reactors too? Because they can produce plutonium that gets reprocessed and like enriched to a level you can use it. You get rid of enrichment facilities and or all this kind of stuff like you have to do to make the fuel for a nuclear bomb. Does Superman get rid of all of that? Does he get rid of the knowledge that we do to make the weapons? Does he shut down engineering programs around the world that teach these kinds of subjects? Does he collect all the books and shoot them into the sun too? What you know is all these kinds of things, things that are at, at Pantex, which is a national lab in Texas that actually dismantles and cuts apart the nuclear weapons. Does he just do their job for them? What about those people? What are they going to be doing uh, for all their jobs? There's lots of stuff that, that is open questions here. Will, anything else I'm missing here? I mean, so also, you know, I, I just thought about this. So he, he takes all the nuclear weapons and launches them into the sun, right? Like, that's actually a pretty huge missed opportunity. So if you remember, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the United States actually bought a lot of uh, the Soviet Union's uh, nuclear weapons in a program that was called megatons to megawatts. So literally, the Russians dismantled the warheads like on their soil, and then all the fuel, like the uranium and plutonium, went to the United States. And it provided something like 30% of the United States power grid from like 1991 until like 2008. Pretty impressive. He could have, he could have done something along those lines. The, thing, the last thing I wanted to mention here is that, you know, when you fire a missile an intercontinental ballistic missile. It follows a ballistic path. It goes into space because that's the quickest way from point A to point B. We have cruise missiles, so we had to deal with cruise missiles too, which only fly through the atmosphere. When you have a missile and it flies into space, it breaks apart like you would think about like the, the space shuttle program. It, it Multiple stages kind of break apart, gets lighter as it kind of travels into space. The fuel tanks drop off. There's like stages of a missile that break apart. So really, once you're at the peak of their trajectory, the kind of mid-course of a nuclear weapon uh, missile, it's only really left to be like this. It's, it depend, they have different shapes, but imagine like a giant man-sized ice cream cone. And that's the re-entry vehicle that holds the warhead that actually lands uh, into the, the city or wherever you happen to be destroying this thing. That's where it is. They don't look like missiles anymore. They're not just giant missiles that they're flying around. Superman doesn't collect those. He just collects the whole weapon itself and is able to hold everything, all these different stages that are meant to be broken apart. He just kind of like blows cold air on them and then can take them into his net. Uh, So he does all of these different things. It's unclear if the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. government, the Russians are cooperating in the movie because they're clearly testing things constantly. But there's no there's no real debate about that. But anyways, we we've been nitpicking this for a little while. Superman definitely has the tools to do this, right? He's got the X-ray vision. Uh, he's got super speed. He can fly faster than than the speed of light. He's really strong. In some comic books, he can literally move a planet. He moves the moon in this one. Right, right. Uh, he's invulnerable. He can survive nuclear detonations if the the need arises. He's got super hearing, so no whispering in the launch silos. Doesn't it won't matter. Uh, and he has his ability to like shoot lasers out of his eyes. He's got all these ability to do these things. In the comic books, it's more of a cooperative thing. Uh, he literally, what did they say? He, he orders 
world leaders to begin launching their weapons into space, and he will gather all of the missiles and catapult them into the sun. Of course, this is a little bit weird because uh, our weapons are designed to follow ballistic paths. They're not meant to just fly directly into space. Also, things like cruise missiles and air-launched bombs and gravity bombs don't travel into space. Maybe they just leave them there like uh, putting out your trash. Yeah, like a UPS pickup. (laughs) Exactly. He makes makes a a call-in pickup. The important thing here is is that the problem with nuclear disarmament is not the logistics of getting these things done. We have the ability, in a very short order, maybe in like a couple of months, to get rid of everything if we wanted to. We could put all that into a job program, a... uh, a Manhattan Project, a Marshall Plan to get rid of nuclear weapons. Re- reverse yeah. Manhattan Project, a Queens Project. Um, <laughs> we could do we could do something along those lines to get rid of the weapons. It's not the logistics that is the problem. The problem is the things that Gabe mentions every episode: prisoner dilemma, the trust, the will to do all of these things. Right, and like if we tried to do that, you could get rid of all of the nuclear weapons, and then somebody could just build one, and that would become the most powerful country. But I guess. Right. In this movie, if somebody built a nuclear weapon, Superman would just come and, and, and snatch it away. Well, see, that's the question. What is the role of a, someone who is a super being like this? Is that person a garbage man who takes out the trash into the sun? He incinerates the trash in the sun. Uh, is he an impartial interlocutor that just kind of does this for the people, but everybody's wanting to do that? Or is he a, a disappointed parent uh, that has to make the kids force up to give up their toys and will en- enforce this? For the world, does he become like a police man, police woman? I think the, the other important question is, what would you do, Tim, in a world where nuclear weapons didn't exist and you couldn't like talk about this on a podcast? I'll have to watch just some of the old movies over and over again and say, this is this is in my day. Think back, think back to the good time. Being in the good old days, we had nuclear weapons. Back to the movie. Lex Luthor meets with a bunch of villains, right? The the villains of the movie. The he 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 meets with these people, a trio of people. A, a think tank strategist who's in a three piece suit. He looks like Herman Kahn a little bit, but with a gun. A black market nuclear arms dealer who is played by Jim Broadbent. Jean Pierre, nuclear warhead dealer to the world. <laughs> and then a mad Russian general. And these people, they're 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 having a bad day because they used to make money off of the nuclear weapon enterprise, but now they can't anymore. So Lex promises to work together to make the world safe for war profits by destroying Superman. His plan is to trick Superman into throwing one of his genetic cloning devices using a strand of Superman's hair to throw that into the sun inside of one of the U.S. missiles. And if they do that, that will have enough uh, radiation, something, to mutate the genes in the machine to make nuclear man, some kind of super-powered creature that has the ability to destroy Superman when no one else could. For those listeners who haven't actually seen the movie, it's pretty remarkably bland how they did this, right? So basically, like, this genetic kit is a box that Lex Luthor puts on a missile, goes into the sun, and then poof! Nuclear man. Right. And he kind of appears out of nowhere with, like, perfect hair, like, a a jumpsuit already. Yeah, Yeah, like, clothes. Six-pack Um, And, of course, he's just automatically allegiant to Lex Luthor. No questions asked. Right. Well, and I love, too, he has, like, long fingernails. Like, they, like, show his fingernails. Like, why Why does he have long fingernails? I, it's why do Superman's sh- other weakness. Uh, it's just bad nuclear manscaping. Um, yeah. Lex Luthor puts his genetic experiment on the tip of this missile. Yeah. He, he gets it launched, and Superman, I guess, he sees this missile launch, and he thinks, oh, this is another one of these, you know, missiles being shot up by U.S. or USSR. Yeah. This is going into the sun, <laughs> thereby fulfilling Lex Luthor's plan to, like, get this kit, and that's where how we, you know, we talked about Nuclear Man being born. So what is Nuclear Man, like, I, I, I was very unclear about his powers, because it's kind of, like, all over the place throughout the movie, but, like, what's his deal? So I think what, we, what we've been able to collect is he, he has superpowers where... He can generate heat, electricity by touch. He's always, like, constantly covered with electrical $15 special effects. Yeah, right. Um, They were clearly very excited to use this one special effect. Yeah. His his eyes can shoot laser beams really well. He can shoot cold air out of his mouth, and that's better than Superman's ability to do that. He also has the ability to levitate things. Like, he levitates John Cryer and just kind of spins him around. I guess he could just do that maybe potentially stronger than superman and he can fly 
But his he has some weaknesses though, some pretty big ones, right, Gabe? Yeah. So I guess there's the scene where he shows up at Lex Luthor's lair. Lex Luthor's kind of be like, "I own you, man. Like you're, yeah, you're my, you know what?" And he's like, he's like, "No, I like I have my own autonomy." And then Lex Luthor's like, "Yeah, watch this," and he like closes the blinds or something and the sunlight's gone and he just like deactivates so he needs the sunlight to to be able to function with no sun so he can't do anything at night um yeah this is an important important point for for the later it seems like a bit of a weakness <laughs> you know must activate during daylight like some sort of reverse vampire also uh one of the uh the the elements of this scene that i wanted to point out was uh when uh, lex luther lights his cigar with like yeah. a nuclear man's fingertips. So that's a shout out to something that actually happened in 1952. So Ted Taylor, uh, a US nuclear physicist, mm -hmm. he lit a cigarette using the blinding light from a nuclear test. So he basically just had a mirror and was reflecting the light from the Whoa. test um, and to light a cigarette. So I, I thought that was a super cool like little shout out there. Smoking is not cool kids, do not smoke. <laughs> that's that's why they have the warning label right uh, at the yeah. beginning of the film. Warning: Do not do not smoke cigarettes even lit by nuclear tests. Cigarettes and nuclear weapons can cause cancer. Yeah, there you go. The rest of the movie is kind of stuff. It's not really all that important for our conversation about the nuclear thing. So I'll run through this a little bit quicker. Superman is like booked himself on a double date with both Lois and Lacey. Lacey Warfield is like. It seems like they're maybe had developing a bit of a relationship there. They go on a series of dates that are also meant to be stories that he's supposed to be covering. Clearly, they're like a trick by Lacey to get them to go on dates. They, they go to a, a jazzercise place where they're working out in the gym. Superman almost kills one of the guys by throwing weights at him, uh, who was being a little bit of a jerk, to be fair. There's some hijinks that are uh, comparable to, like, 90s sitcoms like Sister, Sister or any other uh, dates where you're double date, uh, double booked for your date. Uh, but the important thing is is that Lex Luthor gets on the big screen and says that he has a bomb in this building and that Superman needs to show up. And, of course, it's a trap. Nuclear Man is there. Um, Nuclear Man, Superman's able to figure out, like, really quickly that Lex has created this person using a strand of his hair. I'm going to make a fortune rearming the world. You'd risk worldwide nuclear war for your own personal financial gain. Nobody wants war. I just want to keep the threat alive. Superman and Nuclear Man fight around the world. They fight at the Great Wall of China. They fight at a volcano. Uh, they're flying around with the Statue of Liberty. All of these different things ultimately result in Superman getting scratched across the chest by a Nuclear Man's uh, nine-inch nuclear nails. Uh, and this results in Clark Kent, like, Basically, it looks like the flu, but he's he's dying. He uses the MacGuffin of the Green Crystal earlier uh, to supercharge himself and try to then fight back. Lex Luthor is so happy with his plan that he decides to just cut out the middleman and cut out all these other villains that he's dealing with, right? He just kind of forces them to go away. Apparently, they're making money on this thing. I never understood Yeah, this, this was so unclear. They show Lex Luthor and the cronies with, like, a huge pile of money, and Lex is like, oh, this business has been so profitable. And it's like, Superman's been incapacitated for an hour and all of a sudden like they're making all these like arms sales well there are there are some headlines about is superman gone like is he dead it's never explained well but it's like like how do you amass this pile of money things just happen on such a compressed timeline in this it's just ridiculous who, who is he also selling these arms to if superman has gotten rid of all of the weapons the the mad russian scientists and the nuclear think tank strategists and the arms dealer do they have like secret weapons stockpiles do they have production for facilities producing plutonium do they build the weapons themselves the missiles and they're just like is that who the u.s is buying them from yeah and it's just it, this was just lazy i mean they could have written some short lines of dialogue just explaining some of these basic questions and yeah, yeah it, it could be suspend your disbelief stuff but they didn't even try they just like yeah, they're just like, take this garbage we're giving you and just accept it. It's very, it's super unclear, but Superman, it's, he's back to full power. He uses that crystal from earlier to kind of get better. Fights Nuclear Man all around the world again. He fights Nuclear Man ultimately not just on the world. He goes to the moon and he thinks he's got him because he traps him in an elevator and then takes the elevator where there's no light anymore. And he tries to make Nuclear Man weak again. I guess he figured that trick out. It doesn't work because he's still able to break out. All this kind of stuff. Uh... Can we also, just very quickly, there's a scene where Superman moves the moon to, like, block out the sun to right. try to get him. 
did anyone think like that's gonna cause like huge tidal waves and like all this like destruction on earth like superman's wreaking havoc on everything this is ridiculous i didn't think about that because there's another scene where nuclear man all of a sudden is obsessed with lacey warfield and decides to take her into space to fight superman too and she's just being flown through space and not like dying uh superman can breathe in space but she can't so i was attracted by that plot hole it gets rid of the other one this is like this is like two kids playing with action figure toys ridiculous like crazy it's it's all a lot of stuff uh and ultimately superman the way he destroys nuclear man is as you mentioned he causes an eclipse uh, he then picks up Nuclear Man and throws him into a nuclear power plant's cooling tower. You know the thing in like The Simpsons beginning that has that kind of curved hourglass shape. He just throws Nuclear Man into that, and then he falls through some kind of like open pipe with the radioactive warning symbol. <laughs> and then all of the lights around Metropolis start like shooting back up, uh, and that's how he destroys Nuclear Man. If you would give me a second here, I have a little bit of a a rant on this. This is really not how nuclear power plants work, right? Cooling towers are not really connected to the nuclear reactor portion. They're freaking cooling towers. They let out steam. That's where the, you know, nuclear power plants create heat that boils water, that produces steam, that causes turbines to spin. The cooling tower is where you cool that air out. It's, It's essentially steam. That, that's coming out of the system. They're not connected to the... That's not where... The, if you were to blow one of those up, you wouldn't reduce produce radioactivity. You would just be destroying the thing that releases the, the, the steam. That's what it's there for. But whatever. So he gets thrown into this pipe. There aren't just, like, pipes pumping nuclear radioactivity around. Overloading a nuclear power plant with radioactivity is actually a really bad thing. That's how Chernobyl happened, which caused too much heat, uh, caused a steam explosion. But the important thing is that the comic book is even crazier. At some point in the comic book... Nuclear Man decides to turn himself literally into a nuclear missile, and his plan is to fire himself at both the U.S. and the Russians, and they'll think that there's an attack that's happening, and they're going to fire their weapons, and he'll steal Lacey, and he'll be the king of the world after there's a nuclear explosion. Basically, he's trying to follow the uh, Skynet rules of the Terminator series force tri- a trick attack uh, and he'll be the last one standing he literally turns himself into a missile and it takes superman with lacy to convince him to n- turn himself back into nuclear man it's very 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 silly i will post a link to where you can read the comic book uh yourself uh in our podcast show notes because it is something that is worth seeing but anyways nuclear man is destroyed Superman shows up at the United Nations for a press conference where he gives uh, up on his plan for nuclear disarmament. Gabe, you did such a great job earlier. Uh, Close us out here with what Superman tells the world. Once more, we have survived the threat of war and found a fragile peace. I I thought thought I I could give you all the gift of the freedom from war, but I was wrong. It's not mine to give. We're still a young planet. There are galaxies out there. Other civilizations for us to meet to learn from what a brilliant future we could have and there will be peace there will be peace when the people of the world want it so badly that their governments will have no choice but to give it to them i just wish you could all see the earth the way that i see it because when you really look at it it's just one world I don't really know what that means, but he starts talking about galaxies and stuff. It kind of gets out there a little bit. But he's Superman, so everyone's clapping anyway. It's beautiful. Uh, in the comic books, he takes Jeremy in a spacesuit and flies him into space and has them over the radio. Jeremy describes essentially that scene. The world looks so small from up here in our problems with nuclear weapons and war and, and everything. doesn't seem all that important. It's similar to what they call the overview effect, which right. is that astronauts, after they look on, on the blue dot um, from space, start to f- have the sense of togetherness and connectedness and war and borders and things like that don't really seem like that big of a deal. I guess it's essentially that, maybe? I don't know. Perhaps. We have some loose ends, though. What happens to uh, uh, Lex and... Um... Uh, what's oh Lenny and Lenny, and Lenny yeah well, I don't know Do they get away? Will what happens this is crazy yeah in the movie they're uh they're making their getaway in uh Lenny's car and then uh all of a sudden the car starts to levitate on the highway because Superman's picked it up he flies off to this uh 
Mississippi chain gang drops off Lex Luthor. He's back. They're, all the prisoners are joking. Hey, Mozart's back, yeah. right? <laughs> and then uh, Lenny gets dropped off at a like a school for troubled boys or something, like a Catholic reform school. <laughs> yeah, super weird, right? Like, I, hey, I'm Jewish. Sorry, I, I can't do this. Come on. Um, yeah, he just assumes apparently that he's Catholic. I don't know. Yep, and uh, Superman has this fun line where he tells Lex Luthor, see you in 20 years, which I guess is meant to be a joke about, like, is that his prison term? I, yeah, that's what I think. Seems like it should be for life, but, yeah, but for, okay. Yeah. But it's also kind of funny because it was 20 years before the next Superman movie was released. Ah. Yeah, probably something there, right? Yeah. Uh, so remember that short movie description I, I told you guys at the very beginning from Common Sense Media? They give three out of five points on, quote, positive messages. <laughs> The lesson that it's trying to say that the movie is, 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 is convincing you of is that some goals are well-intentioned but too difficult for any one man, no matter how powerful, to achieve alone. The Earth is our home, and we should do what we can to keep it from being destroyed. Go with your gut. Which is seeming the whole go with your gut thing was the thing that got him in trouble in the first place, but nevertheless, that's the kind of message that kids ate and up. Should be getting well, and this was like this is kind of a trend I think in a lot of those eighties. Like you remember, like Captain Planet, and th- where they were trying to like put in like messages for kids. I think they've just completely abandoned that in the modern day. Mm. Like yeah, super. Eight. But yeah, this was still the they were trying to like food, spoon feed you some some yeah good uh, you know like recycle and and don't smoke cigars and, <laughs> yeah. and all this kind of thing. Well, Christopher Reeve had a, had a you know a good heart, and when he wrote this, he said that. Uh, the plot's positive message came to him when he was narrating a children's TV show, which was called Message to Our Parents, where he said that children were talking about what it's like to grow up in the atomic age. And at the same time, people were also saying that I had the attention of the kids and I should take advantage of that. And meanwhile, Warner Brothers was saying, let's do it. Let's do another movie. So he said, OK, let's as a way to consider that topic. Uh, another inspiration for him was there was this activist, an American student, really a young person and a peace activist named Samantha Reed Smith. And I think we might have talked about her on the podcast previously. She wrote a letter in 1982 uh, to the general, uh, Soviet general secretary uh, in Dropoff, and he, she asked him to cool down the Cold War tensions. Um, she got a personal reply and an invitation to visit the Soviet Union, which she accepted. And it was a a really big story in the news. Um, But unfortunately, on an an unrelated trip, but a little bit later on in 1985, uh, she was in a plane crash uh, in Maine. uh, Beechcraft 99 crashed, and it was really big in the news. Uh, So Samantha Reed's story inspired Christopher Reeve uh, to to write this particular story uh, as well. It's it's quite a movie. I'm sorry I made you guys watch it, but I, I think there's some interesting stuff to continue to talk about. Uh, with the nuclear discussion. Will, well, I'm really glad that you're here so we can talk about this. The first thing I want to mention is that there's this comic book out there that everybody should try to grab if you're interested in the subject. It's from 1985. It's a Superman comic. The title of it is The Day the Earth Died. And the important thing here is, um, and I have a bunch of screenshots of the comic if you haven't been able to get access to it on our Twitter uh, handle, which is the Nuclear Podcast. If you go on there and search for Superman, you'll find some of these uh, screenshots. The Superman has a reoccurring nightmare where there was a global nuclear war after peace talks fail between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. He debates by flying around and looking at all of the different nuclear weapons in the world. He tries to ar- argue with himself. Should he disarm all of the nuclear launch buttons? He could do it. He could do it really quickly. Um, but ultimately, he decides against it because he figures that humanity needs to solve their own problems. They need to learn the lessons of Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki and basically solve this problem on their own. So it's a different take on the idea of Superman doing this instead of actually going about and trying to solve all these weird logistical problems that we talked about in the movie. He decides against it, and that's the story that's there. Another source material for for the Batman vs. Superman movie is this story uh, called Dark Knight Returns. In that story, Superman is basically an errand boy for Ronald Reagan. Uh, he is the nuclear deterrent. He can both destroy the Soviet Union, and he's real life, you know, flesh and blood strategic defense initiative, Star Wars, missile defense. He can take out any incoming attack and destroy it on his own. And he ultimately does that, except he's nuked uh, by a special Soviet missile that is designed to destroy him. Um, and there's this whole uh, story about kind of how Superman responds to that. And they have a version of it in the in the movie Batman vs Superman. So there's all of these other stories that exist 
with Superman and nuclear things, and I want to uh, ask Will in particular some of these questions. So let's let's delve into what would it look like if nuclear disarmament was finished in an afternoon. Let's assume that that's what Superman was doing. You know, we're both in favor of ridding the world of nuclear weapons. Uh, would you consider the approach that he did uh, safe? Would you rather he do it a little bit slower? Uh, what would that mean for things like the state of conventional deterrence? What would the U.S. allies do, the ones that claim that they depend on the U.S. nuclear deterrent? How would that look? There's lots of questions that are here. Honestly, if if the scenario of nuclear disarmament in an afternoon were, were feasible, I really don't see it being all that problematic. Uh, hmm. I mean, you know, nuclear... The nuclear level of deterrence is only one level of deterrence, right? So if, uh, for instance, you mentioned our allies that uh, supposedly rely on the nuclear umbrella, they would just switch over to relying on our conventional umbrella. Um, you know, I, uh, U.S. military power, uh, conventional military power outstrips anyone, right? So the, like, if you're talking about uh, military expenditures, like annually, you've got the United States number one and Russia is number two, and we outdo them by a factor of 10 to 1. So, you know, like, it, I, that wouldn't be uh, particularly problematic. Um, as I think you and I have discussed before, what's problematic is, so literally what happens in the movie, right? Like, so Superman gets rid of all the nukes, then Superman gets defeated, Lex Luthor starts rearming the world, right? It's that rearming process. Yeah. That's where it gets really, really scary, right? Um, country, like, you know, we, we've only lived through one start of the arms race before, and we're frankly lucky to have gotten out of that um doing that again i think people would kind of states would try to learn from their mistakes um there would be a high incentive to let's say the united states like quickly gets an arsenal of like 10 weapons right well the soviet union russia only has three let's nuke them with r10 before they get their three off the ground right so it creates all these lose them or use them uh, use them or lose them incentives it's scary well and the other i guess the question from a non-nuclear person here i mean how does the dynamic change when there are fewer weapons and a nuclear war does not mean the instant like destruction of the entire planet yeah but it means you know a a few cities get lost and then it like transfers to conventional war. Does that maybe encourage more like a reason to use these weapons? Well, this is, this is a subject that a lot of people have been debating uh, in the, in the deterrence community. Uh, one person who's very famous for writing a lot of the way we think about nuclear deterrence these days, Thomas Schelling, he wrote one of the major pieces on this uh, arms and influence. And he, he wrote about this uh, subject uh, in 2009 when then president uh, Barack Obama uh, called for a world without nuclear weapons. And he was, Thomas Schelling was particularly concerned about the rearmament problem. So here's what he said. If at the outset of what appears to be a major war, every responsible government must consider that the other responsible governments will mobilize their nuclear weapons base as soon as war erupts. There will be at least covert, frantic efforts, or perhaps purposely conspicuous efforts, to acquire deliverable nuclear weapons as rapidly as possible. And then what? The first would be to acquire nuclear weapons would be to use them, as best that we know how, to disrupt the enemy's nuclear mobilization bases, uh, which would be things like not just army bases or military bases, but it would be like their ability to make new nuclear weapons, while itself continuing its frantic nuclear rearmament, along with a possible surrender demand backed by its growing stockpile. Other possibilities are to include uh, to demand under the threat of nuclear attack, the abandonment of any nuclear mobilization, with unopposed inspectors or saboteurs searching out the mobilization base of people, laboratories, fissile stashes, anything else that is threatening. And a third possibility would be a decapitation nuclear attack, along with the surrender demand. And I could think of worse. All of this, of course, would be in the interest of self-defense. So that's quite a lot that's there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a concern. Um, but again, you know, so let's just say that we, we get to this world free of nuclear weapons. You'd have to have some kind of inspections regime, right? Yeah. Like, so kind of like what uh, RIP, the JCPOA, right? Like this, uh, the nuclear ideal that we had with Iran signed in 2015. Inspectors on the ground to verify uh, all their enrichment facilities weren't actually pr producing highly enriched uranium or their power plants weren't producing plutonium. Um, that could be used in a bomb, uh, any suspicious military activity, like in a, a highly secret military facilities, you know, inspectors could get access to that within within three weeks. You'd have some kind of regime like that. But also, just even if 
none of these verification measures were were accurate. Part of the whole process of fielding a deliverable nuclear weapon is testing it, right? That's what we've seen with North Korea. So the second a test goes off, we can detect it. Like we, we have a comprehensive network of monitoring stations around the world. So, I mean, I, there, I don't see a kind of like breakout scenario where if everyone's gotten to zero, you're going to have advance notice if someone is trying to cheat and rearm. The idea of the, all of those verification things work if you don't have like a Superman who can trust but verify with x-ray vision and super hearing. You also hope that if one country decides to th hold the world hostage with nuclear weapons, the idea there is, is that the entire world will work together to defeat that country. You know, in a world where there's no nuclear weapons and one person decides to break the taboo and that country is considered to be that they void their existence um, and their government and everything else gets destroyed. And the longer you go with no nuclear weapons, you hope that there's this uh, taboo that continues to grow, a norm against any use and all that kind of stuff gets strengthened together. And I, the important thing, too, is, is that as much as you're concerned about rearmament, and a lot of people are, even people who are skeptical in favor of nuclear disarmament but are like, think it's the good way to do it, go about it. I think the argument is really strong, which is, look, yeah, rearming could be a danger, but you know what's also a danger? Every day we have nuclear weapons that are pointing at each other on hair trigger alert. It's eventually going to get us. Well, what's worse? A world where there's thousands of nuclear weapons that are all going to be fired at each other in the course of a nuclear conflict or a world where there's five. And that is a little bit better and we can deal with the problems as we get to it. And that's you know, tends to be the position that a lot of the advocates for, as you mentioned, the, the nuclear ban treaty, that's kind of some of the things that they've been arguing uh, in line in line with it. Th that's the problems of rearming are not as bad as where we are today. Yeah. And that's pretty convincing to me, even as someone who's concerned about rearming. Um, and we don't have a Superman to kind of deal with that. We don't. But, you know, uh, it's um, we, we can achieve a lot through diplomacy and, yeah. and working together. Um, and But frankly, also, you know, just your, your your point about the, you know, comparing is what's better, a world with like, you know, five nuclear weapons or a world with, you know, where the United States and Russia have 1,500 each, right? Um, just from a pure statistics standpoint of the odds of something going wrong, like for instance, the uh, Damascus incident that the United States went through in the 1980s where uh, one of our Titan II missiles just blew itself up in, in Arkansas, mm -hmm. right? Through, through human error. The more nuclear weapons you have, the higher the odds are that mm. like something like that's going to happen. If you only have five, the odds are going to go go way, 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 way down. What really scares me about the world that we live in right now is that everybody seems totally cool with taking that risk. And that scares me to death because it's not a matter of if something's going to go wrong. These are man-made machines. And as everyone who's had a car or a computer or any man-made machine, they break. They, they break down, things go wrong. And with nuclear weapons, there is no room for error. We've had tons of near misses already, and it's, you know, we've, we've gotten a little bit better at preventing those, but, uh, you know, a little bit better isn't good enough. It's like there are people that are concerned about the dangers of nuclear weapons, but they still figure the best way to deal with this is to keep the weapons for now, and then we'll try to get to that scenario in the future. So in the world of Superman 4, one thing I wanted to talk about is, like, why do these world governments essentially just agree to Superman's plan? In in the comic book adaptation of the film, there is this one scene where you have a split, a split panel where the United States is at a computer. Uh, some Someone in the United States Army is at a computer and is saying, wow, Superman's holding himself to his word. 85% of, of Russian nuclear weapons have been destroyed. And then you have the next panel in Russian, uh, someone saying, like, oh, comrade, the the – Superman has destroyed 85% of the West's weapons. This isn't a trick. So clearly he's like doing it piece by piece. The, the world is cooperating with him. In the movie, it's not necessarily very clear. And I, I think it's sad to me that the only v people in the movie who seem to be resisting Superman are these comic book villains. Like a guy in a three-piece suit who just seems to be feasting upon the, the, the profits of, of nuclear arms. And the only people that believe that nuclear weapons are good are an arms dealer, a r mad Russian general, and this like comic book character of a think tank person. You know, as someone who thinks nuclear weapons are pretty damn dangerous and wants to get rid of them, I think that there are people out there who really have an honest belief about these things, and it's just weird to not have that view also represented here. Yeah, no, I, I agree, and um, I think the movie just takes, once again, from the uninitiated person's perspective, it just capitalizes on this 
seemingly universal belief among people that like nuclear weapon is a negative thing and it doesn't go into the nuance of that you know in terms of going along with it though i really do come back to that solution for the prisoner's dilemma game and that it's to me that there's something interesting that could be said there i mean i think to um there's the whole um base realignment and closure process right yep. this was a way that we had too many military facilities uh after the cold war we need to get rid of them but no representative from those districts would be willing to go to their constituents and say, we're going to close this base that brings a lot of revenue. So they created this commission that was uh, separate from the political process. And then the representatives could say to their constituents, I have no control over this. There's this commission out there. They're telling me to do this. I'm fighting real hard. But you know, maybe that's what they're getting at here in terms of why they why they're able to just accede to, to Superman's, you know, will here that everyone wants to get it done, but they know the, the real politique just isn't going to allow it. That, that's, that's a good point. And this gets back to your question earlier, Gabe. Why does Superman stop there? Why doesn't he decide, uh, we need to get rid of right. tanks next, or we need to get rid of uh, conventional bombers, military writ large. And you said there's some other comic the Superman yeah. comic that deals with this? So there's one I'm going to mention and recommend at the, at the end of our podcast, but it's called uh, Injustice, Gods Amongst Us. And it's a story where Joker decides to kidnap Lois Lane and then put a device in her heart that if it stops beating, it will detonate a nuclear weapon that he's hidden in Metropolis. He then uses special like Scarecrow, who's one of Batman's villains. He laces one of Scarecrow's fear gas toxins with kryptonite so that it could affect Superman. And he tricks Superman into thinking that Lois Lane is Doomsday, the, the creature that killed Superman. And Superman fights Doomsday. He takes it out to space and beats it up. And it turns out he actually was beating up Lois Lane the entire time, causes her heart to stop working. Bomb detonates in Metropolis. And he is destroyed by this feeling. And he goes up to Joker. And as we know, Superman doesn't kill people. He punches through the joker like rips his heart out and then superman becomes essentially a one world government dictator who believes that all weapons should only be run by superman he has the best intentions the whole story is about the comic book characters that join superman to build this peaceful world under his super power dictatorship and those like batman and others that try to resist him and then a couple people like uh, wonder woman who's like superman but also doesn't like what he's doing and that's the series. It's also, it's a really good one, and it is where Superman takes that extra step. And I could see a world where if Superman would have continued in the quest for peace to do what he's doing, that would have been the next thing he would have done. Would have been like, all right, guys, let's get to the table and say, would you like me to do this, but with, for tanks? And then would you like me to do this, but for AK-47s? I can do knives, too. You know, maybe he could build on incrementally. Uh, for this plan but anyways i think that's interesting the last question i have for will is what kind of message do you think that this movie says about nuclear disarmament and peace movements you know the people that we know in the nuclear uh, test ban in the nuclear uh, weapons pr prohibition ban treaty what does it say for what they should be doing and the role of citizens in convincing their governments to ban the bomb 32 years after the movie came out we're in exactly the same place, right? Mm -hmm. Like you've got the got some uh, fewer bombs, you know, maybe a little bit yeah, better. Yeah, got some but... got some fewer bombs, but you know, the the permanent five uh, members of the Security Council, the nuclear weapons, uh, the recognized nuclear weapons states, and the unofficial nuclear weapons states are not ready to give up their nuclear weapons, right? They are the ones that are resisting the TPNW. That's the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, tooth and nail. If you remember, like in the opening scenes of the movie, when they're uh, in that classroom after the summer collapse and jeremy like speaks up you know they're one of the suggestions is oh let's write to our members of congress guess what we've been doing that for decades hasn't gotten us anywhere mm -hmm. so it, it it was kind of depressing and disheartening in that way if anything you know like you had things like this movie as cheesy and terrible as superman 4 was like it was like a major hollywood blockbuster right it had christopher reeves in it gene mm -hmm. hackman john crier john crier Nuclear weapons are not, do not have the same prominent status in, in popular culture anymore. So if anything, the odds of nuclear disarmament actually happen are kind of getting worse because the yeah. narrative is just decreasing. People aren't worrying about this as much. John Cryer should have had a very special episode of his television program, Two and a Half Minute Man. Uh, where <laughs> they talked about the nuclear arms race, right? That, that would have been great. I think yeah, that, that would have been a great idea. Um, so, but yeah, like just uh, re-watching this movie uh, made me just, it, it kind of, 
uh, left me in a place where I felt kind of disheartened about like, man, we're having the exact same conversations 32 years later, not a whole mm-hmm. lot has changed. Yeah, well, let's let's say that we were um, in 1986 and we're watching this movie in, in the theater. We're one of the 20 or so people that saw this uh, in the theater. And before we go our separate ways, uh, um, preview to go back home and watch Superman 1 to clear the palette, uh, let's have a quick conversation about some of the non-nuke discussions here. You know, for you, Will, who read the comic books but hasn't seen the other movies, Gabe, who is over most of the modern superhero movies, I mean, what do you guys think about Superman as a character? Do you do you like him as a as a storytelling device, as a as a character in a story? And do you think he's the right person to talk about these kinds of subjects? So, uh, I'll, I'll start it off. So uh, I I think Superman is uh, he, he's a compelling superhero, right? Like there there's a reason that uh, the story of Superman has been around for like almost a hundred years, right? Mm-hmm. Like. Give or take, the he's got a compelling backstory, and uh, you know, as far as uh, like the the vehicle here, the idea that he can just rid the world of nuclear weapons and kind of uh, draw a parallel between his experience with Krypton going under because of its own folly. The story that they found was super compelling. Mm. Um, they just they it was so poorly executed. I feel bad for Christopher Reeves to a certain extent. It seems like he was really vested in this, uh, helped write the story for it, and then kind of got screwed over by this uh, company that uh, decided to make the movie on the cheap. Gabe, do you want to see a reboot of this uh, done with a bigger budget? Oh, please no. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I look. I'm not uh, very familiar with the Superman lore. Um, you know, what I will say is I thought it was interesting because he clearly has this ethical dilemma side to him. He's, he's clearly a very thoughtful, uh, omnipotent uh, superhero. But to me, they just wasted this opportunity for him to deliberate about the merits of getting involved. It just they try to cram it into this love scene with Lois Lane. And it's yeah. like, oh, just follow your gut. Everything's fine. And th- you don't really see that uh, ethical dilemma play out. And it's kind of it's kind of glossed over in favor of just you know, some action filler at the end. So I thought from that perspective, it was it was a very missed opportunity. Yeah, I think the, the, the day the Earth died is a better story that talks about Superman's internal conflict. It's also mostly just him kind of talking to himself, staring very introspectively at a, a nuclear silo and, and talking about how easy it would be for him to just rip the the, the door off and like take this, the nuclear uh, armament apart. Like in the art of the poster for this movie you actually see superman like opening a silo door and like ripping the nose cone off with the warhead which would be a more re- realistic depiction of how you would go about and do this you wouldn't take a whole missile you would just rip the top of the missile off and then just throw that into the sun basically i do think that superman to me was always one of my him and spider-man were my favorite comic book characters growing up because of that how do i as someone who can do everything one lead a life like and we talked about this pre- in previous uh, podcasts, but like as someone who can at any point be saving someone, how do you have dinner? How do you have a relationship? How do you go to the bathroom? You at any point could be saving someone. And how do you deal with that? I think that's a really cool psychology of a character. And also the fact that Superman's planet was destroyed, you know, by the hubris of its leaders. He's a major weakness is radioactivity from kryptonite. He's an eternal optimist. All of that kind of stuff is so fascinating. But for me, the last kind of little thing I want to add here is he is very much a reflection of the fact that we had a strong nuclear and anti-nuclear peace movement. And for, as Will mentioned, for decades have been trying to accomplish this task, but we haven't really been able to move that, that particular goal closer to us. And it is a reflection of Superman, who in the comic book terms, he could solve this problem very quickly with no, uh, you know, show there'll be consequences, but he could do it. But the fact that he can't is a reflection that he has on, on his own and a personal vow of not being getting involved But it is a fascinating also depiction of storytelling. If he were to just solve the nuclear problem, there wouldn't be much of this other threads of stories that the rest of the DC universe will have to deal with. If he could just solve world peace, what's Batman supposed to do? So the fact that he literally, as a storytelling tool, is restricted from solving the problem, it becomes a reflection then of the world that we live in, of people who actually have been trying to deal with this. Like Ronald Reagan wanted to get rid of nuclear weapons. He got to Reykjavik and was sitting in a room with the you know the Russian leaders and was like, if you read those transcripts, they literally say, well, you want to get rid of nuclear weapons? And the other side's like, yeah, that actually sounds like a great idea. But because they weren't able to test missile defense, that was one of the requirements 
that the Russians had. They couldn't do like real testing. It stopped everything and broke it apart. As as powerful as Ronald Reagan could have been on this topic, he couldn't do it. So if Superman can't do it, it's a reflection of that. Well, this gets to I, like more fundamental questions um, that have been expl- explored through story about you know why does evil exist? You know why can't we achieve this utopia kind of thing and. You know, I agree. It would be a lot easier if we had that. You know, maybe the the ending of the movie is a reflection that even with all the perfect pieces aligned, we just live in a world of imperfection where evil does exist, and it's our job to try to make it better, but but we just can't. Yeah, it's a lot of deep questions for this very silly and poorly made movie. Um, the last one thing I want to talk about is. Uh, do you think Nuclear Man was necessary for this movie? Does he serve any purpose of this other than just kind of being a villain? I think there's some layers of of the nuclear danger that Superman is trying to fight, but it's I don't understand the metaphor other than it's just a weird supervillain who... Do you think this movie would have been better without a Nuclear Man? Could they have told that a little bit differently and had him maybe grappling with world leaders or Lex Luthor convincing the world that Superman is out to become a police dictatorship? I think that would have been a more compelling story to me, which I'm just I'm now realizing I'm just talking about how great the comic book series Injustice is. But uh, I think they should have explored Nuclear Man's because like he's just kind of born out of nowhere. He acts very robotic, but it's said that like, he's a living like sentient being, and it it'd be funny to see him when he's not doing deeds for Lex Luthor. Like, what's he is he like complaining about his boss? He's like, yeah, this job <laughs> sucks. Like, he's mostly just sun tanning, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly, and like trying to avoid like nighttime. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, so I. I I honestly think it was just it was a very cheap mechanism for like portraying nuclear weapons are the bad guy in this right and like mm. nuclear weapons are the problem that superman is trying to solve oh how do we do this oh we just like have a nuclear man that represents nuclear weapons i agree what i think it would have been much more effective for instance if the world you know so that scene early on in the movie where everyone at the un is clapping would have been great if they had everyone clapping except for the nuclear weapon states right and they resist Mm. tooth and nail then you would have had like some really cool imagery like that movie poster you're talking about where superman like busts into the silo rips off the warhead and flies off with it right like you could have had that you could add scenes of him like busting into like the bunkers at interlake air base in turkey like Mm. taking out the nuclear weapons and saying like these are mine now punk like done i i just feel like that would have been a more effective believable story and it would have been fun to see elect playing both sides while at the same time profiting from uh, the continuation of nuclear weapons and war eh, i think it would have been kind of cool we got the story that we did and let's do our rating system here to wrap up here we always do one out of five to be consistent one being you know not so great five being this is the best uh, movie i've ever seen and i'll recommend it to my grandmother but i also like to tailor it so that if we're getting super critical about the content, the tailoring of the rating system also has to be precise. Uh, so I, I ran the numbers here. I've, I've consulted with Lex Luthor, the smartest man in the world. And what we've come out with is a scale of one to five strands of Superman's hair. Because one strand is good enough to clone a nuclear man, but it's just kind of creepy to be carrying around one strand of people's hair. So, But if you have five strands, you can claim that you were starting a Locks for Love donation program for bald superheroes. Like professor x or luke cage or someone else i will give this two strands two solid strands of superman's hair i think it's a interesting movie poorly executed i would love to see better takes on this subject i as a kid i liked it but even as a kid who didn't understand nuclear weapons and how they worked i definitely thought wow it's weird that people just keep launching their nuclear weapons around and and Superman's, at least he's there to stop it from happening. It didn't make sense to me even then. Well, how many strands of Superman's hair would you give? Uh, two strands, uh, mostly for the same reasons. I'll give it an A for effort and an F for execution. It was just, it was a bad, bad movie. Um, so, yeah, two strands. Uh, I'm going to go brutal here. I'm going to say one strand, and, which I usually reserve for movies that are unwatchable from a like filmmaking, acting, technical perspective. This wasn't that. This was... They tried to tell this, like, lofty story and just, like, if you're going to aim that high, like, don't give it to this production company that is going to do it on the cheap, right? To me, that's critical error in judgment. Do not watch this film. You say there was a lot of split ends? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. All right, so let's let's talk about some things that we'd actually recommend people check out. You know, I have three things. One is this documentary from 2014 called Electric Boogaloo, 
the wild untold story of Canon Films. The documentary is just incredible to see how two people can break into this system, which is usually pretty uh, not inviting for people from the outside uh, to be able to get involved with and to see the craziness that was involved in the 80s. Uh, I recommend the comic book series I talked about here, which is the Injustice Gods Amongst Us comic book series. I think it ended in around 2016. Uh, you can get all that stuff really quickly uh, on the internet, but also check out The Day the Earth Died from 1985. It's another you know interesting comic book story. And finally, uh, a book by Michael O'Hanlon, who is a scholar at the Brookings Institute, called A Skeptic's Case for Nuclear Disarmament from 2010. Uh, I think if you want to get into this subject of, of someone who was in favor of nuclear disarmament but has some questions about how to get that done, I think that's a particularly good entry point book to be able to to look into that. And if not, the book, if you, if you Google that title, you'll find some interviews that he's done about this. Uh, Gabe, do you have anything you want to recommend to people? Yeah, I mean, along the lines of the omnipotent superhero who maintains a balance of nuclear peace, we've talked about it here on the podcast, or you've talked about it, uh, Watchmen, the, the Watchmen series, and um, uh, you know, I think that provides a much more elegant discussion of these types of things, also with a omnipotent character and political implications. So I think that's a good uh, contrast to this. Cool. Well, we did a yeah, we did a podcast episode on that um, on Watchmen earlier. I think it was last year or earlier this year. Will, do you have anything you want to add to this? Uh, yeah, I think I've uh, recommended this on uh, on the podcast before, but uh, yeah, so I referenced earlier uh, the Damascus incident. Uh, I'd check out Command and Control uh, that uh, details that incident, exactly how it happened, and how close we came um, to, uh, to really ending it all. Um, and I'd also recommend uh, Knowing the Adversary by Karen Yarhi Milo. Uh, it's a book. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. Um, and that kind of speaks directly to this question of the rearmament, right? Like knowing what your opponents are doing, the psychology behind that. Uh, it's a great book, and I'd highly recommend it. Cool. I, I think Command and Control has been recommended on this podcast about a dozen times. So if you haven't uh, read that book or watched the Netflix documentary, that's a, well, the documentary it's available on Netflix. Then I don't know why you're not. I don't know why you're still listening to our podcast. But thank you very much, Will, for coming back onto the podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, hopefully, we'll have you back on again soon. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Gabe, welcome back. Uh, sorry that this was the, your return point, but you're, you're going to be back on the podcast again I soon. Love, and... I love being your uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000 <laughs> test, yeah, robot, whatever. Well, we're going to get some good stuff uh, upcoming. I know you asked about wanting to do another Twilight Zone episode. Yes. And I've got something like that in the works. Um, two really good Twilight Zone episodes that deal with nuclear weapons. One of them is a very famous episode called Time Enough at Last. But another one, which I believe is called No Time Like the Past, uh, which is a time travel one that also involves nuclear war and things. We'll do that. Those are two good episodes, and I, this, I'll make it up to you. That's awesome. That? No, I'm looking forward to that. Let's do it. Great. Uh, Will, anything you want to plug uh, moving forward that, we're, that I forgot about? <sighs> Nothing I can think of off the top of my head. Just your Twitter. Just my Twitter, yeah. Uh, yeah, follow me at Will Satron. Um, I tweet a lot about uh, the political madness that uh, the United States is going through right now. Uh, but also, if you want hot takes on a nuclear weapons policy and North Korea, um, I'm your guy, at Will Satron. Great. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Super Critical Podcast. If you have any for suggestions for future episodes or you want to tell us what we got wrong, either nuke-wise or how we ruined truth, justice, and the American way for you, there's a couple ways you can contact the show. Supercriticalpodcast.com. We just updated that with a bunch of new features. So please uh, check that out. I uh, like that website. And it takes a lot of work to update, so I hope it's helpful for people. On Twitter, at Nuclear Podcast is where we talk about the show. And we're also on Facebook and an email account that I check, Supercritical podcast at gmail.com until next time this has been tim westmeyer and gabe and will and remember if it's pop culture and radioactive we are bound to get super critical about it have a good one